nine CEOs, and I think they were responding out of their concern, which we very much share, Surgeon General and I do, and I think all of you do, that there is this strong public distrust and skepticism, and they wanted to come out and say very clearly, hey, we're not trying to pull something here. We don't believe in putting forward anything that's not absolutely safe and effective. We're pledging this in writing. I hope that added a little bit more confidence to the people who are still looking at this and wondering. I was glad to see the statement. Thank you, Dr. Thank Collins. You. Senator Romney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the members of the panel for uh, your uh, your testimony today. I have to thank in particular Dr. Collins for uh, uh, the slides, uh, the this description of the process uh, that's leading towards a vaccine was, uh, was most informative uh, and colorful. Um, I, I want to pick up a question that, uh, that Senator Murkowski uh, described, uh, and that's with regards to the growing sentiment, uh, I think, across our country uh, of people who are, if you will, anti-vaxxers, uh, people who, uh, who are avoiding vaccines. And, and uh, I have been approached uh, during uh, visits to my state by people who have whole books that are written describing uh, why vaccines are bad, why they're made from uh, adulterated sources, and I won't go into all the details, but it's not like just a, a social media phenomenon. I mean, it's a literally, there are literally books out there that are written to describe why vaccines are bad. And, and I wonder uh, if, if, if it does not make sense for, uh, for our government to put out a very comprehensive effort uh, to dispel this growing sense of vaccines being bad. And, uh, and I, I don't know how you do that, but it would come to mind that, that you're doing that with regards to tobacco and, and massive advertising on TV. Uh, you could have debates, you could uh, call in these people who write these books and, uh, and have discussions with them, which are, which are publicized. Uh, you could have much more aggressive campaign on, uh, on uh, social media. Uh, I guess the question I'm asking is, should we be doing more than we're doing and what could we be doing to, uh, to resolve the uh, the debate, the uncertainty that so many Americans have about the wisdom of receiving vaccine. And I'll, I'll ask Dr. Collins and, and uh, the Surgeon General both if you'll respond to that. Well, I'll start, but the Surgeon General will have a lot to say about this. This has been, of course, an issue for our country, not just in this season of COVID-19, but before that. And particularly, one has seen the consequences of that with measles, for instance, which in the year 2000, we declared that the U.S. had succeeded effectively in getting rid of measles. And now last year, we had more than 1,000 cases. And people have forgotten that kids die of that disease and continue to die in other parts of the world. I think we have benefited from the success of vaccines so that a generation has sort of lost track of the fact that these are preventing diseases that take lives. I just saw an estimate that if you looked at all of the children born in 2009, and you asked what would have happened if none of these vaccines had been available, 42,000 of them would have died. Imagine that, 42,000 kids dying for preventable conditions because vaccines were not available. Well, they're available now, but if they're not getting used, we're facing that same kind of terrible consequence. And it is heartbreaking, and I must say frustrating, and sometimes even causes you a little bit of anger and frustration that this kind of misinformation is so readily spread by people who have another agenda. And we have a hard, hard road to go to try to counter that when so many people don't see in their own experience the reason why this is such a life-saving activity. But I'm going on a bit. Surgeon General, please say what we should do about it. No, thank you, Senator. And I'll very quickly walk through. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is using a three-tiered approach to improve vaccine confidence through research and evaluation, collaboration and partnerships, communication strategies, and knowledge dissemination. I put out an op-ed earlier this year with the secretary and with uh, CDC Director Redfield. We're working with platforms like Twitter and Pinterest and Facebook to uh, make sure appropriate and, and, uh, and accurate information is displayed prominently when people do a search. CDC developed Vaccinate with Confidence, a strategic framework to strengthen vaccine confidence. Uh, we're working with uh, minority medical schools like Morehouse and beyond. But uh, you, you mentioned vaccine, uh, uh, vaccine resistance and the anti-vax community. It's important to understand that 90 plus percent of parents out, out there are actually doing the right thing. And that when you look at the 10 percent who aren't, most of those 10 percent aren't in that anti-vax or I say vaccine resistant category. They're in the vaccine hesitant category. 
And that's who we need to really work on. And we need to work on educating them and engaging them and being compassionate with them and patient with them to answer their questions. And I went out to Washington when they had the measles outbreak last year. And I found that when they had after hours uh, conversations with parents, uh, they'd come back two, three, sometimes four times. But most of those parents, when they got their thank questions, you. thank you, Jen. thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, I, I, my time is uh, virtually up. I'll just make one more comment, uh, and that's for uh, Dr. Collins, and that's with regards to the Russian uh, uh, announcement of a vaccine. Uh, clearly, very little data, but are we evaluating the, the, uh, the, the promise of, of vaccine efforts in other countries, and do they have much prospect for being of value to us? We certainly are to the extent that the information is being made available. Uh, and obviously what you'd like to see is a publication that's been peer reviewed. And some of that is starting to come now from the uh, vaccines that are being developed in China and Russia. Um, I must say uh, the way in which the Russians rolled this out, declaring victory before they had gone much beyond a phase one trial, did not win them a lot of confidence in the scientific community. And so we really have to be insistent that if somebody is going to say this vaccine is safe and effective, that they have lived up to that very high standard. And I think our country establishes those standards and others generally follow them as well. So yes, we're watching, but some might have said that the effort that Russia had put forward was putting a lot of people at risk, asking them to take a vaccine that hadn't gone through that. Some even called that Russian roulette. Senator Romney, your time's expired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Smith. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. I want to first thank Dr. Collins and Dr. Adams for your service to our country and uh, for everything that you were doing. I know that everybody on this committee is um, dedicated and optimistic even about uh, the goal of having a safe and effective vaccine that can be distributed at scale and also can be free for everyone. And so I want to just uh, touch on that for a minute. Um, you uh, last month i introduced my covid 19 treatment act which would ensure that folks who get their health insurance through medicaid or chip or people who don't have health insurance at all would be able to get a free covid 19 vaccine and this builds on um, actions that we've already taken in congress to make sure that folks that have private insurance um, or receive their insurance through medicare um, have a free vaccine. So, um, Dr. Collins, I want to drill in on this a little bit with you and just understand a little bit about how we can make sure that this happens and that folks aren't stuck with out-of-pocket costs that they're not expecting if they get their insurance through Medicaid or CHIP or if they're not insured at all. So first, can you just uh, confirm that the federal government will buy this vaccine and also will, and also the supplies that are needed to administer the vaccine um, and make that available to providers at no cost? Yes, I can yeah. confirm that as part of Operation Warp Speed, uh, as these various vaccines are chosen to be put forward uh, and the deals are negotiated that allows the government to buy and own uh, tens or in some cases hundreds of millions of doses that then can be provided for free to providers. And along with that, of course, all of the other materials you need like syringes and vials and uh, PPE uh, is part of the package. The only thing that then needs to be dealt with is any kind of charge that the provider might give for administering the dose. And I know the administration is committed to making sure that that does not become a barrier to anybody and you can get this completely for free if that's what you need to do. Great, that was my sec that's perfect. That was my second question, that there aren't hidden charges, administrative costs, um, that th that would also be reimbursed um, by the federal government so that folks don't get stuck with something they're not um, anticipating, which is, of course, particularly a barrier if you don't have any insurance at all or if you um, have a Medicaid. I think the administration has made it clear that no one uh, should de be denied this uh, vaccine. Uh, it needs to be completely free. And if, let's say that we found out that we needed a booster, some sort of a, a booster shot or not like a two round vaccine, but you need to get a booster like we do for other um, infectious diseases over time. Would or should the federal government also cover the cost of those boosters at no cost to folks? I don't know that I've heard that conversation going on yet because we really don't have the data to know whether such boosters will be needed. And if so, how frequently would the booster have to be provided? We're all hopeful, of course, that this vaccine will produce long lasting immunity, but that's not always going to be the case. I think that's a downstream discussion. At least it is for me. And we're talking about COVID, but uh, I think it's important that, that we just operate under the, the underlying uh, belief that all vaccines should be provided at minimal cost to people because they save lives and they're cost effective. They're cost saving. 
Well, and Dr. Adams, I think, um, you know, the, the, the point here, of course, too, is that this is really a matter of, 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 of public health, but it's also a matter of equity because we know that uh, black and brown and indigenous people, people of color are more likely to be uninsured um, and um, more likely uh, to, to be, you know, to, to be facing this struggle. So I think it's, it's just extremely important. Um, so I'm going to ask all of my colleagues on this committee, I would be so grateful if you would join me on this bill. I think it uh, makes a very important um, statement and also makes a very important step towards, towards ensuring that this vaccine, when it is available, and we all are optimistic about that and, and eager to make sure that it is safe and effective, that that vaccine is av available to everyone um, and not just for free of charge. Um, I think I just have a couple more questions. So Dr. Collins, I want to just ask you, um, uh, one one question. Um, what just I think people are so concerned about this and how this process, which we we have to trust in, can be um, trusted. So can you just explain to us a little bit about how an event kind of what would be the end point for when we know that this vaccine trial should be completed and be done? What is the end point? So let me quickly explain how that works. Uh, let's say we have 30,000 people involved uh, in a trial, which is the number we're aiming for for all of these trials. Half of them received the vaccine. Half of them received an injection of a placebo. Nobody knows whether they got the vaccine or the placebo. But then you track those individuals and you look to see who, in fact, gets infected with SARS-CoV-2. What you're looking for, of course, is a circumstance where those who got the vaccine have significantly fewer cases than the well-matched uh, folks who got the placebo. That tells you the vaccine is working. As it turns out, by the time you've seen 150 cases of SARS-CoV-2 in this group of 30,000 people, if your vaccine is at least 50% effective, you're going to know it because you're gonna see a big skewing in terms of who got the disease and who did not. And that's basically why we say this is an event-based decision process for deciding about efficacy. You count those events and you know whether it worked or not. And if the DSMB, which is the part of this enterprise that's looking at this, sees that, then they raise their hand, assuming they've also looked at safety and found it acceptable, and said, okay, FDA, it's time to have a look. That's how it works. Thank you. I know I'm out of time, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Leffler? Jones here. Uh, Senator Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you both to our witnesses today for your service and for being here. You know, I, I want to go at this a little bit. Um, I want to get some specifics on some of these crazy theories out there, guys. We talk about them and we see this. And I appreciate Dr. Adams saying that 10 percent of uh, parents out there um, are only 10 percent are not doing the right thing by getting vaccinations. But all of this, you know, has been with smallpox and measles and other things, which, which we've grown up in a different era. Now we're in an age of social media, and we see Facebook, we see Twitter, we see the Internet full of all of these conspiracy theories. I'd like to give both of you an opportunity right now, because one of the things I'm not seeing from NIH or from the federal government is efforts to really debunk these theories as opposed to just getting positive information out there. So Dr. Collins, Dr. Adams, each take one or two of these theories. Tell us what you've heard, what's the most outrageous thing, and debunk it for us as quickly as you can so that the American people right here on the record know that they should not follow these absolutely crazy theories that are out there about vaccines. Can I go? Dr. Go, go, go. Uh, I'll take the first one. Vaccines okay. do not cause autism, and people need to understand that. We've looked at the trials. We've looked at the studies. Vaccines do not cause autism. And I'm agreeing that one, but I'll tell you the craziest one I've heard, which is this is all designed by Bill Gates, and when you get the vaccine, it has a chip in it that's going to get stuck into your system, and it's going to watch everything you're doing, and people believe that stuff. <laughs> so none of the vaccines are designed to kind of be big brother over people and to, and to follow them. They're designed, I, I take it, to save lives, correct? That's exactly right. Uh, exactly. To save lives and to save money, sir. The vaccinations avert $402 billion in direct cost and $1.5 trillion, trillion in societal cost. And that's just the flu vaccine every single year. I have a T-shirt that I like to wear sometimes, although it isn't always well received. And it has three words on it. It says, vaccines cause 
adults. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. I, I, I would, though, encourage both of you with re your respective positions to do a little more in terms of actually debunking the theories. I appreciate all that you're doing to get accurate information out there. I've been doing a live uh, uh, Facebook Live every week with a healthcare professional to try to get accurate information out there. But still debunking the theories is also important. So I would encourage you to kind of do that on your websites and do that in information, not just trying to get the accurate, but to debunk some of this garbage that we're hearing out there.